You've heard it said, use it or lose it. Today, we're going to talk about financial maintenance and how it's important that you use it right. You are listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhees. Financial maintenance is an interesting thing, and like many other types of maintenance, it's important to do, and yet if you do too much of it, you'll find yourself missing out on other opportunities too. Oh, absolutely. You know, my dad taught me about uh, vehicle maintenance. A vehicle that's not maintained properly is worthless, and when, especially at a time of an emergency. So mm-hmm. not only did he teach us to keep our vehicles maintained, but also to keep them full of gas because you never knew where you might need to go. Uh, and you didn't want to be caught in a situation where you needed it fully maintained and full of fuel and not be able to do what you had to do. Yeah, and breakdowns always seem to happen at the most op- inopportune times. They, they always do. It, it's never convenient to have a breakdown because you're always in a rush to do something or, oh, I wish you would have done this. And that's what happens financially, too. When people don't prepare and keep their finances in order and maintained, um, you know, an unintended occurrence can just devastate them. Mm-hmm. So, so when we're talking about maintenance, I, I think there's a there's kind of a principle that underlies it. The reasoning, the reason behind we're, the why we're doing this maintenance is for resiliency. So, so we can bounce back. You know, ha- have what we need at the proper time. Um, that that would be the key idea behind maintenance. Would you say? Yeah, and and the maintenance can be overkill too. Sure. Um, you know, when we started flying an airplane, we realized there's certain things that have to be maintained on the airplane, or the airplane isn't airworthy and it has to stay on the ground. But when you start messing around with an airplane uh, and doing too much maintenance on it, just because it's there and you want to fiddle with it, then that airplane has a history. Uh, or people that do that, there's a history of more accidents and more deaths and more crashes with airplanes that have been messed with than that just uh, are monitored in their function. You know, that's interesting because uh, the airlines, that is standard practice for them today. It's called needs-based maintenance. They watch the uh, statistics on the engines, the temperatures, and things like that, and they can pretty much tell when the certain piece on the engine needs repaired. And this, this type of thinking has its roots way back in Britain, I forget whether it was during World War I or World War II, um, where the Royal Air Force noticed that a lot of their planes were crashing right after major engine overhauls. Yes, and because they were just saying, well, this engine needs overhaul because it has 1,800 hours on it versus, oh, this engine still, all of its parameters, its temperatures, its cylinder heads, all everything's working right. We're going to leave it alone. Mm. And so there's some things that um, make sense, like, Every 100 hours, you need to change your oil because the oil synthetically breaks down and now it's not doing its job. That kind of maintenance is good, but when we start undoing bolts and nuts and turning things and looking internally at the engine, now we're messing with that engine's, uh, you know, nature Mm -hmm. and a human error then plays a huge part in destroying it. And that's what happens in people's finances too. It, sometimes it doesn't take a lot of messing around with things to just to keep it going in the right direction. You know, you attend to it, you look at it, you monitor this or that, but you're not getting in there and changing and moving around where you're putting your money and, and those type of things. Because when you when you take and and do that, you risk having human error. Mm-hmm. So, so in the engine world, you know, when you start taking apart those nuts and bolts and taking pieces out of the engine... I mean, aren't these engines made at a factory? So aren't those pieces mostly identical? Not necessarily, because as an engine works, it it wears evenly. So now you take a brand new part and you put it in there, and it doesn't fit like an engine that's got, you know, 1,800 or 2,000 hours on it. And so that then becomes an issue with that engine. Oh, this is like a foreign part in here almost, because mm. even though it was... The factory built identical part. It's not identical by the time it gets replaced. So, so it's going to wear differently. It's going to wear differently. Interesting. Now, 
even though all these engines were built in the factory, does that mean that they're all going to run at the same temperatures and perform the same way? Are they are they are are they are they all going to need overhaul? You know, at a certain point, let's say twenty five hundred hours or three thousand hours. No, you know, years ago, I remember a, a car dealership in Portland, Oregon, when we lived there, that gave a, a gentleman a brand new Mercedes Benz because he had driven that Mercedes Benz for over 350,000 miles, and all he'd ever done is change the oil in it. Wow. Now, that's not going to happen with everybody because it's the way he drove that engine. Mm-hmm. It's, the, uh, it's the way that he did proper oil changes. He probably did analysis on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, just like we do on an airplane where we see if things are wearing, right? Because different parts are made out of different metals. And as it wears, you can detect what is wearing in your engine by analyzing the oil and seeing what kind of minerals and, 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 even and, and, and metals well. without even touching the engine. Mm. And so, you know, but, you know, some people could have bought the same model of Mercedes-Benz that gentleman did and not gotten 100,000 miles out of it just because of the way they drive. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it depends. Maintenance is a very um, important thing, but at the same time, it can be overdone. Mm -hmm. So so what about the people that, um, you know, let's take the airplane world again. What about an airplane that sits on the tarmac? That's one of the most um, horrific things that can happen to an airplane because they were designed to fly. Uh, just like an engine that sits in the uh, the car garage at your home and is only used maybe once or twice a month, or uh, you know that engine, all the oil drains out of it and goes down into the pan, mm-hmm. and uh, when you start it up, intensive wear on it, because uh, a lot of the parts no longer have any lubrication because it's all drained out. Mm. So um, things that were made to run were made to run a ship tied up in harbor is going to get loaded down with barnacles and is not going to sell as well. So, um, yeah, that's why it's so sad to go by the airports and see all the uh, the aircraft today that are parked just waiting for customers because the airlines can't put them into service right now. It's costing the airlines a fortune. Maintenance. And maintenance. Yeah. And so it definitely makes sense to use the t- financial tools that you have available um, you don't want them sitting around. You don't want to do excessive maintenance on them as you use them, though, either. And then, so that's a balance that we're talking about here, really. It is. And, and you know, in our home, you know, it's important that we check uh, 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 how the roof is doing. Um, mm-hmm. That doesn't mean we have to get up and climb around on it because that will wear the roof out because it wasn't designed for us to walk on it. But we want to make sure that uh, we keep our our house painted on the outside, not just for looks, but for maintenance, because that protects us from the elements outside. And, you know, there's no question about it. Keeping our landscaping nice and trimmed makes the value of our property worth more than if we just let the weeds grow tall high and and never take any maintenance or sweep the sidewalk or anything like that. So some maintenance is good. and, And the scripture warns us about this and says, be sure to know the state of your flocks and pay close attention to your herds. For riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to every generation. So we want to be careful. We want to take care of the things that we're entrusted with. But at the same time, we don't want to mess with their functionality too much because that then starts destroying the value. Mm -hmm. So there was an insurance entrepreneur, Earl Nightingale, uh, comes to mind. He was in the broadcasting world as well. But he, uh, he gave an example that, uh, is coming to mind right now that he says if you drive by the neighborhoods that have high rates of unemployment, you would think that these people would at least have time to keep their yards uh, clean and titty, and yet those are some of the most disorganized uh, neighborhoods as well. Yes, uh, in that respect, and so it really comes down uh, when you when you're worth talking about maintenance, whether it's a lack of maintenance or an over or maintenance overkill, it it comes down to a mindset at the end of the day. Oh, Jesus warned us about the overkill too. He said that, you know, if, and basically said if it's not broke, don't fix it. Mm. You know, we need to monitor it. That's that's maintenance is monitoring. That's probably the best maintenance on many things. But he said, you know, consider the wildflowers and how they grow. They don't weave, they don't work, and they don't spin their own clothes. And yet Solomon in all his splendor was not dressed like one of these. So if we do our job 
of monitoring and taking care. And we don't have to really get in and get our hands all greasy and dirty and make make things all torn up in our financial world. We just need to be consistent. Mm-hmm. Consistent with the right things. Because unless the Lord builds it, whatever you're doing is in vain anyway. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's his. We're just responsible for taking care of it. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, I've heard it said that there's an old adage, I think multiple people have said it, that opportunity is what happens when luck meets preparedness. And <laughs> keeping the proper maintenance uh, so that your car is ready to go at the right time, that has fuel in the, in the fuel tank, uh, that's part of being prepared for that opportunity because we never know when that opportunity is going to be hot. It is. You know, let's go to another example of overkill in maintenance. Um, I think one of the first people to ever write about this was Dr. Starfield in the American, uh, uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association. And his research showed that 106,000 people died annually as a result of taking medical prescriptions that were prescribed for them. That means that... So that's not illegal drugs. That's not illegal drugs. That was, a, that was something that was prescribed to them by a physician, and it killed them hmm. because... The physician gave them something to maintain their health, which they didn't need. That's overkill. It's overkill. That's overkill. Furthermore, he found that 45,000 people die every year due to errors in hospitals, and that's not from infections or medical errors. That's because of other maintenance issues that went wrong. Hmm. On top of these, he found that 80,000 people die every year from infections. That's an error in the proper maintenance procedures in a hospital where something unclean is used in a procedure where everything should be sterilized. Hmm. And 12,000 people died every year are victims of surgeries that were unnecessary. Now, that could be anything from cosmetic surgery to a doctor just... uh, like the doctor recently up in Redding, California, that was doing open heart surgeries on people that didn't need it. Mm. That's overkill, in my mm-hmm. opinion. All right. And this happens frequently, annually, like 200 and some thousand people every year die from these type of maintenance issues in healthcare. And you add them all together, that's quite a little, it uh, adds quite up. A little number. It's, it adds up. It, it's right up there competing with the deaths from cancer and cardiovascular disease when we do that. Wow. So is maintenance always a good thing? Hmm. Well, it depends on what you call maintenance. If we're monitoring things, Mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with going in and getting your blood pressure checked. That doesn't invade your body. But when they want to start putting things inside you or cutting you open, now we've got human air that that comes into play, and that can be killing. That can be murderous. So... What happens in the financial world is very similar to that. No, it sure is. You know, study after study after study has shown that average fund managers cannot even come close to matching what the market returns are. So these would be people that are trying to beat the market with a special fund. So they're going to take uh, certain assets and they're going to invest it um you know, in certain companies that they think are going to do better than the market over. They're going to kind of manage someone's money to outperform what the market can do. Okay. And and so there's a couple different types of managers for those of you uh, um, who aren't familiar with the terminology. There's active fund managers, which would be the ones who are going to try to find a better deal in certain areas based on certain parameters that they set in the fund. And then there's passive managers they're going to track an index or something so they're going to, they're going to manage it has some oversight over it but they're they're not going to try to do anything special um, other than make sure that the you know that the fund is diversified perhaps if that's in the in the scope or that that it's structured correctly and jack bogle was a very very prominent passive fund manager mm-hmm. he didn't believe that you could he proved that you could not beat the market and so he said it's better just to passively Trag along an index or something instead of trying to actively outperform what the market does because the market is the entire world's interaction together. You cannot predict that. It's mm-hmm. it's a, and and these studies that have been done show that you know a monkey throwing a dart at a dartboard are probably more precise 
are cats and when they take their naps. You know, there's all kinds of studies that show that random things are more um, productive than an active fund manager are. So this would be an example of where monitoring type of maintenance would perhaps be better than trying to actively get in there and change a whole bunch of things and passive turn over assets. Let's do the that. oil analysis. Let's let's you know have sensors that read the temperatures of the head of our cylinders. Let's you know measure what's coming out the exhaust pipe and see if we're burning too much fuel or not. All those things are available in engine wear. You know, just like there's all kinds of things that we can look at in our health. You know, if we're carrying too much weight, if we're you know, feeling short of breath, if we're, you know, our blood pressure is going crazy, if, uh, you know, we monitor our urine and see if we're spilling sugar over, those are passive things. No one's invading our body. Mm -hmm. um, they're not poking things down our throat. They're not sticking us with things and they're not cutting us open. Those are active types of things. And when we get into active healthcare measures or maintenance, the risk of disease, infection, and death rise tremendously. It's the same thing in finances. Wow. What else happens financially that, uh, that we can learn from as we talk about maintenance and how, how much of it is a good thing, how much of it uh, turns sour? Well, I think on the, on the macro level, I'm just shocked today at the modern monetary theorists who continue to blather spin, 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 regardless if you're going in debt or not, because that's what makes our economy and that's what maintains our status quo in the world. That is so That's short-term thinking. That is short-term thinking. Yeah, it might spur um, a, 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 bu a boom for a while, but we know historically looking back that when booms are created because of that, of of, of of deficit spending, that the crash is coming. Mm -hmm. it has to be reallocated at some point. In time. It, it does. It has to be reallocated. And so today, consumer debt has reached fourteen point five six trillion dollars in the fourth quarter of twenty twenty, and that's up uh, you know over a half a almost a half a billion dollars from the previous year. Wow. So it's it's just amazing how consumers have bought into this modern monetary money theory. It, it's, you know, you can't spend more than you have. Uh, Margaret Thatcher once said, you know, this works as long as there's other people's money to spend, but pretty soon other people's money runs out. So, so perhaps um, what some people are thinking with this is, well, with inflation going crazy, I'm going to, you know, go into debt a little bit and buy some things that I want to buy so that the value of those things will at least have that when the inflation takes up. What's the problem with going into debt to do that type of thing? I mean, I mean uh, to, to some degree, you can follow that reasoning, but what's the problem with that, especially with consumer debt? Oh, the problem with that is is inflation. You know, let's let's just consider a home in 1990. If you bought a home in 1990 um, at $300,000, the U.S. Labor Statistics uh, uh, says that that home now is, is worth about $645,000. And we do the math on that over those uh, those past years. That's an equivalent of a two point four two percent rate of return on your three hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so not as much as it at first might seem, but you know, it more than doubled. But still, that's a pretty low rate. That's annually. a low rate, especially when you consider that inflation has decreased the value of your dollar dollar by two point four two three, which is more than the you know the two point four two percent. That your value increase. Yeah, so, so, so right about right about the same or a little bit more. So inflation ate up all your profits. Okay. So have you really got ahead? No, because you have all the the upkeep, the maintenance on your home. Mm. You have all the insurance you had to pay on it, and all the taxes you had to pay on it. So, so financially speaking, um, you didn't really get the value out of that, even if you did, you know, get to live in the home and enjoy all the benefits for those thirty two. You years. didn't get the you didn't get the monetary value out of it. You might have got some emotional value out of owning your own home and the, and the joy of, of building and, and calling a place home. But without the depreciation and the tax benefits of, of a business property where you're having a rental or something like that or a commercial piece of property, you know, Robert Schiller says there actually is a non-existent rate of return on your own residence. Mm. And so 
um, you know, this is going back to, you know, how much debt do we assume to buy assets that we think that are going to be an appreciate? We have to realize that inflation is going to cut the value of those down. Mm -hmm. So um, that so doesn't mean that you can't make money buying your home, fixing it up and selling it. Certainly kind of like not. flipping yeah. a rental or yeah. flipping a property. In fact, that's pretty, pretty popular these days. People are into real estate and the, when the market is hot, that type of thing tends to work well for people short term. In the seller's market, it does if you can buy properties that um, are less valuable. But when a seller's market, everything seems to inflate too. So mm. Interesting. So, so how much of this consumer debt that we're talking about here, how much of that is on credit cards? Oh, my goodness. It's, uh, I can't remember the exact statistic right now, but you know, I know that people are paying like $122, $120 billion just in credit card interest and fees. Okay. That's not paying the principal off. That's just paying the, the interest, interest on and it. the fees on their credit. And that's, that's just so, so incredible. Based on, based on credit card interest rates, you know, that's, it's got, that's probably about a trillion dollars at least in credit card debt. Yeah, and and sadly, student loan debt now has surpassed credit card debt, which brings up a whole other story is, is, you know, less than 50% of the people that go into debt to get an education ever work in the field that they got their degree in. So how, how worthy or how much worth or value did that education provide them? It's questionable. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I saw saw a, a spoof the other day, uh, kind of mocking college education, uh, saying that someone was going to school for discounted knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. certainly, certainly not discounting the tuition, but perhaps the knowledge. <laughs> well, in maintenance, it's like um, you know, talking about financial maintenance. One of the biggest things that we need to monitor is our debt to income ratio, our DTI. That's like monitoring, um, you know, the the oil analysis on an airplane and seeing where the wear and tear is taking place. Okay. Um, what it does is if, if you're, you know, if you're making 45, uh, if you're making $7,000 a month or so and, and you have liabilities of 4,500 a month. So that would be payments on debts? Yes. Okay. Then you figure out the ratio of those or the percentage and, and that's a, you know, your DTI is going to be like 64%. With that kind of numbers, so so you would take forty five hundred dollars a month for the debt payments and divide that by your seven thousand a month of income, and that will give you point six four or sixty four percent. Okay, that's right. And keep that's, in, that's a pretty high debt ratio. That's a pretty high debt ratio, and and it's important to know that most home loaners, most mortgage companies will not loan money to you to buy a home if your DTI is over forty three percent. Hmm. And the FHA guidelines say if it's a if your DTI is above thirty one percent, you're not eligible for an FHA loan. So this DTI is like a monitoring; it's a maintenance thing to see if you're in control or not of your finances. Mm -hmm. And one way to improve your DTI is to transfer debt you have into life insurance. And and why doesn't life insurance affect your DTI score? Because life insurance is doesn't even come up in that parameter. It's not it's not on the radar screen. It's not something that is monitored to figure out what your DTI is. So it gives you an advantage over other people that don't have life insurance, because if you've transferred you know a big portion of your monthly liabilities to a life insurance policy by leveraging your whole life insurance, that doesn't even show up in the in the figure that that banks and mortgage companies are using to figure out your DTI. And, and why doesn't it show up? Because you would think if a bank is looking at this and they're wanting to look at all these different sorts of debts, um, are, are they considering the life insurance policy loan not really a debt? It's not a debt because it's fully collateralized. So not only is it fully collateralized, it's the interest for the first uh, for every year that you begin is completely paid for. Mm -hmm. So there's no risk there to the insurance company, so there's no liability to you. So if, you know, if you... So, so, so what that means, you could walk away from the policy and there wouldn't be any additional liability. There would be no liability if, at if all. If worse came to worse. If worse came to worse. And okay. so it's just not part of your DTI, and that allows then for your DTI score to go down 
which then allows you more opportunity to use other people's money. And using other people's money is one of the best ways to build real assets and sustainable wealth. Cool. But here's the catch. There's always something that has to happen before you can leverage something. Mm-hmm. You have to own it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean how did you build the collateral there in the first place? Well, it, And then that needs to happen over time. It does. And a lot of people think, well, I should wait till after I get out of debt before I build this collateral, before I start planning um, you know, this reserve in life insurance for my future. Uh, but that kind of... Uh, that kind of gets out of order uh, because it's because then you're going to have to go back in and do major financial maintenance to add the life insurance later. Whereas, whereas if you go ahead and put, get it in place now, then you just have to do the monitoring and the checkups along the way. That's so true, John. And it's um, all hard work brings a profit. The scripture tells us that. And we need to be diligent in keeping a portion of everything we generate. And one of the best places to keep that is in whole life insurance that allows you to participate in the profits of the insurance company. So they call that participating whole life insurance. And when we do that, now we have this financial maintenance tool that takes us off the radar screen. And we're able to use that then to um, to be just one step above or of what everyone else is doing. And as Nelson Nash always used to say, everything we do in the financial world is compared to what everybody else is doing in the financial world. And so if we have this unseen stealth tool called participating whole life insurance in our corner, then we excel much faster and have much more sustainability than what everybody else is doing. Great. So what about people that already have life insurance? Maybe they have a really big policy and they need to do, uh, let, let's say they took policy loans on it and the interest got a little bit out of hand. Um, what, what, what type of maintenance would be in order then? Well, sometimes it's, uh, you can just uh, end up walking away from a policy where the interest has gotten too high because you've borrowed too much uh, and, um, and it becomes uncomfortable or um, un, un, uh, fiscally impossible to keep up with the interest rates. And at that point, walking away from it didn't cost you anything unless you have borrowed more from the policy than what you paid for it. Mm-hmm. And then there could be um, some tax ramifications because you're going to have to pay taxes on the growth between what you paid for the policy and what you you borrowed. So if you borrowed, you know, say 150,000 and you've only paid 110, you're going to have a $40,000 tax liability that you've got to include as income. Yeah, so 40,000 your income would be up by that much in a year. So so that only makes sense because you got more value out of it than you ever paid for it and yes. you got the life insurance coverage. <laughs> okay. So um what would be a more sustainable way to go about that? Um instead of having maybe one big policy that you then have to walk away from or adjust a big time uh, later, what would be a more sustainable way that would give more options uh, to somebody that's approaching their golden years? Well, as we're building whole life insurance, a lot of people think, well, I'm just going to buy this one big policy. And in many ways, that's unrealistic. First of all, you can't buy a policy as big as you would like it in your 20s or 30s that's going to meet all your financial needs. And so instead of trying to manipulate and over-maintenance a policy and try to squeeze more money into it, it's just better to start a new policy if you're still healthy and young enough that the cost of insurance is in your budget. It's affordable and comfortable. And so uh, that's why we own so many different policies. Um, at one time, we owned 60. I think we're down now because some people have died and, and some people, you, you, your children have bought back policies that we bought on you when you were younger. So, uh, but the key is here is we want multiple policies and we want to fund each policy when it's comfortable and affordable for us. So the rule that we always fall back on is the 10-20-70 rule. Where are we keeping the 10% of everything we're making in life? And if we do that, 
and we buy life insurance with that 10%, then we will find ourselves buying policies on a frequent basis throughout our lifetime up until our mid-60s probably. And then, um, you know, we might be buying policies on our grandkids or, you know, at that point. Sure. But the key is, is we've got to have something to leverage that's off the radar screen of the rest of the financial world. And that's what the life insurance gives us. Yeah, it's a wonderful guaranteed foundation. So what you're basically saying is this uh, system of small policies will allow you to do financial maintenance and monitoring a lot less invasively than having a big one that you would have to do a major remodel on or an overhaul on at some point. Exactly. You know, if you borrow from one policy and you have to surrender it because the interest rates, the interest that you're paying on it just gets uncomfortable and and what you plan to borrow and pay back never never came about, it doesn't hurt your credit score. It doesn't hurt anything. You can say, I'm okay, let's just get rid of that policy, mm. okay? Uh, or maybe you're, you know, in your golden years and, and you say, oh, my, uh, I would really like to have um, a guaranteed income for the rest of my life. You can, you can trade the cash values in one policy in for a guaranteed annuity, mm-hmm. and that will give you that guaranteed income. Keep the other policy for the death benefit in case you die before your spouse mm-hmm. or... Maybe you just want to leave a legacy to some foundation or charity or or your children or grandchildren. Yeah, so it lets you cut up the pie into different sections and do different things with different sections. That, that's that gives you a whole lot more flexibility with that way. And of course, the balance is is that you know breaking it up into multiple small policies, you're going to have more capitalization time uh, for each of those policies. Um, you know, so, so there is a balance, as with everything. There you know, is. It reminds me of years ago, the Craftsman Tools put out this shop saver machine. And it was, um, you know, an all-in-one inclusive machine. It was a table saw. It was a skill saw. It was a, it was a belt sander. It was a planer. And the problem is, is it took you, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to convert <laughs> it from one to the other. And it probably wasn't really great at any one of those <laughs> functions. <laughs> well, it depends on how well, mechanical you were, <laughs> whether you got everything squared up or not. Um, that's what a lot of people want to do with one policy. They want to make it be everything. Mm. And it's just easier to add extra policies as you go along instead of trying to make one policy be everything. Mm. Makes, to- makes total sense. And so the takeaway from today, you know, with, with the financial maintenance and monitoring, um, you know, you, having a system of policies to work with makes it easier to do less invasive maintenance and it makes it for a more sustainable system. And that's what you want. At the end of the day, you want to build sustainable wealth. Yes, so, we want sustainable wealth. You know, my father had a craftsman mower and it could convert to a rototiller. Hmm. And invariably, every time we wanted the mower, it was in the rototiller mode. <laughs> and every time we wanted the rototiller, it was in the mower road mode. And, you know, it's just inconvenient. And that requires ma- invasive maintenance, active maintenance to change it from the one to the other. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's better just to have a rototiller if you need one and a mower if you need one. And it's the same thing with life insurance. If you've got one life insurance policy that you're building for retirement income, you've got another one that you're building to, you know, to uh, to be there for a legacy. If you've got another policy to build there, that is, that's the way we approach it. That makes total sense. So you're listening to Wealth Talks with the McFees. You can check out uh, the book, How to Build Sustainable Wealth. Uh, It's on our website, life-benefits.com. You can also call us at 702-660-7000 and order your copy of How to Build Sustainable Wealth. You're listening to Wealth Talks with the McPhees. Have a great week, and we'll be back next week. 